Good morning, everyone. My name is Song Liu. I work for Facebook, aka Meta. Today, I want to talk about uh, the possibility to debug with BPF, like BPF2, within a container that is not uh, globally, you don't have global permission. So, we all know debugging with BPF is great. We enable great tools, but the, the, the key, you need to have cap BPF and or cap admin, cap sysadmin, cap uh, net admin, and more. But uh, cap BPF is not uh, secure. It's not really secure or not secure at all. So, which means we cannot really do that for containers. So the question is like, is this still possible? Is this possible to find a sweet spot that uh, we can keep it uh, secure, while still make it, uh, while still keep it useful at least for maybe a large portion of all the use cases. So here are some ideas. I think right now what we really can do is like uh, have the predefined the tools to use either set cap or have some ping the program to say, I know this tool is secure, it uses BPF, it won't hurt the system. But obviously the problem is it's not uh, flexible enough and you only have certain tools. Yes, please. Hello. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, how do uh, you said tool writers define secure BPF programs for non root users? How how does how do they define that? Is it by uh, a hash map, or is it by like certain programs or? Uh, uh, which line? The first the first sort of point you were mentioning here. I. I or is it just like something you've already tried, or is it just an option that you haven't tried yet? Uh, I think that's what uh, currently we do with uh, uh, other tools that you use uh, special capability. You have like, uh, for example, password. Uh -huh. You have the capability to do the password for non for non root. You can change your own password. So we trust the tool itself is well written uh -huh. and gave capability to that tool. But this is like a, this is like a, a, a SE Linux policy of some sort, I guess. Like how how is this implemented? Define secure BPF programs for non-root users. If it's if it's if it is not, I mean, it's like uh, if you the two writer write something, you do certain things very well defined, predefined things with BPF, uh -huh. and that will. You, you make sure that is secure and you allow non-root users to run exactly that program. Okay, okay, yeah, that's... Sorry, it's probably not clear. So, but this, that's not the key, hopefully. Okay, I mean, if it, yeah. the, the, the answer, I guess, is like, it's not flexible enough, so let's not bother about implementing it, I guess. Oh, this may, may be still useful in some cases, but that's not the key I want to discuss okay, today. Oh, we can take that offline. Yes, thank you. Okay, so the second uh, idea is the main idea I have for this, uh, this, this discussion is like, uh, can we do the mandatory filtering of your BPF program based on the ownership? And we'll go to the ownership later. So if you have a non-root users program, we'll only trigger on the events that you own. For example, like uh, this is, uh, so ownership could be your current task. If you are in the process context, you trigger event on your own task. You can trigger that. You can see that. If you trigger event on some other task, we're gonna like the kernel will filter that for you, so you will not see that. And another thing is the the perf event. If you the non root user can open task based the perf event. And if you have a FD to a perf event, attach a BPF program to it. That's we can, with some other limitation, we'll see that's relatively safe for the non-root user. And also if you have ownership to a socket, you probably have a, like a 
socket uh, uh, event, a tracing event on it. Um, another idea, I think, uh, part of from from how is like uh, whether we can have some security enhanced map. For example, it's like a task uh, local storage. If you have non-root user, you have only access things for your own task. You got a question, Brandon? Sorry. The second one, mandatory filtering, filtering based on ownership, uh, that will mostly work. There's asynchronous stuff like IO completions where you don't own the IO completion, but you want to trace it. I've thought about, I've dealt with this a lot, and I think that we can make it work. So for example, if you can only see events that are in your context that you own, and you can't see, for example, IO completions, you just have to walk up the stack until you own the context. So if you go up to a syscall level, then you own the completions. And so it wouldn't, it would be annoying for me to, to deal with that for, for say, container users, but I could make it work. It would break a whole heap of tools, right? If you said mm. you can't see com all this async stuff that you don't own, but my point is, I think there are workarounds in many cases. Yeah, that's uh, like, uh this, uh, I get the same feedback last night on the flight here. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, let, let me go over that in the details. So, so I did some homework. It's no means this is a, the whole picture of BPF uh, use cases, but this, this is my homework. I try to be not biased about this. And I look at 41 tools under BCC Lib BPF tools. And 24 tools just filter on current tasks and the process context. So I mean, I think we can easily transfer if we have a current task-based filtering that enforce on non-root created BPF programs. And three of these tools was the start and the model Brandon just mentioned. You start tracing something on your process context, and actually the end happens in the IRQ, so you cannot use current task to find the ownership. So uh, a two, one example is to trace the IO latency. You start the read, you want uh, the, the exact latency happen in the IRQ context or soft IRQ. And interestingly, there are more tools using context switch than the start end model. And then the switch, uh, schedule switch is kind of really useful task and it's probably worth some special attention to make it work. And there are three tools use perf event and I didn't pay much attention. I assume if you only do perf event for your own task, it's 90% it's working. And there are four tools attached with the socket with TCP connect or something. And the last three tools, they're really in the IRQ, soft IRQ context. And that's probably the trickiest we, we need to handle. So we start with, with current task and perf event. And basically we filter, we, we implement, if we implement a filter based on current task, that is good for process context. And if the non-root user can create a, a task a perf event, we can use that to get a part of the features down. It means we cover 24 plus three twos here. And the start end model, this, what Brandon mentioned is one of the easier ways than what I have here, I guess. But the one thing if we want, really want the context in the, uh, the, in the IRQ context, we can have the start program, which is filtered based on current tasks. And we add a key with, with the BIO, with SKB to a harsh map. I think we probably want BTF enabled or maybe even referenced map in this case, but uh, that's something I'm not quite sure. So basically we, but the rough idea is to use this harsh map as the filter. We populate the element into this harsh map and the start program. And in the, and before the end program, which is in the IRQ, we use this harsh map as the filter. And if this not, uh, if the, the data coming from the, uh, into the end program is not in this map, we just skip it. And of course, once we use that, we need to free up the, to free the key from the, 
uh, after we use it in the end uh, program. Yeah, that, that will sometimes work. Um, for things like I.O., you've got I.O. mergers, and all sorts of things can happen before the I.O. is issued. And like determining who is the, all the owners is a mess. I think they'll work for some things like uh, scheduler wake-ups, because I want to know who woke me up. But that's firing in someone else's context, and that's pretty clean. So I think that there are some, some places this will work, and then some things like networking and I.O., which do mergers between different requests from different owners, that this gets a bit messy. Uh, yeah, that's very true. <laughs> uh, no. I have another question in, in this uh, context. Would it make sense? I mean, just thinking out loud, maybe it's completely stupid, but to abstract that ownership model in terms of, I mean, for example, like a program could have multiple owners, right? And would it make sense to, abs to abstract that to, I don't know, something else, like an identifier where you would filter on that or like a bitmap or something like this? or? So I'm not quite sure I follow this. So, but the idea I s here is like the, the picture I have here is BPF trace. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so basically, you you run something for a short period of time, and just like uh, the user, uh, the user started that in the container. So I don't see like multiple owner of a program is uh, a common case here. Okay. I'm not sure whether that answers the question. Oh, it's fine. Okay. Yes. So I actually we have other use cases. There one we have multiple owner of one program, but that's uh, it's probably gonna uh, we call, we're probably gonna to resolve that in different uh, ways. Hmm. All right. Okay. Just pretend I solve this. So uh, <laughs> can you, yeah, so, so for this one, start and model. So this is still, so this is you describing how the tool can be written, the program itself to be safe within a container, right? So it's not the, there is nothing automatic here. Like kernel, kernel cannot do this kind of stuff for you, for like arbitrary program to make it uh, safe I and have contain, some right? idea on that. But not, not for this case, like, right? So like, you just in general, like, yeah, this pro prob reading, mm -hmm. like tracing tools do prob read, right? Prob read yeah, anything in the kernel, there uh, yeah, is no, like how prob read can be filtered. Like you're talking, well, the whole tool runs in like current task, sure, but then what's next? Like as soon as program starts, it can prob read any way it like, like arbitrary address. Yeah, I think proper read is probably one thing we, we want to, to disable for many use cases. Or one thing I, I was thinking is so we have a, for example, we have a task pointer. If we use the core to do the read, that's, we call that allowed. But if you, or oh, maybe we limit how deep we go with core. But like out of those 24, like so, if, if you go back to the, the previous, right? Like 24 tools use filtering on current tasks. How many of those use BPF core read? Like some variant of that? I didn't track, but, but not probably so, like not, every single one, no? Not so many. Not no. so many. Because as Alexei said, like once you do probe read, like all bats are off. You don't know if you're reading like something from the kernel, from your task, like. So, yeah, uh, um, you, so, okay. so basically you're, you're, you're saying like we should just disable probe read. For, for, for such tools? Probably if you do probe read of random things, or if maybe with you can probe read certain BTF pointers, or you can do only certain types or something, you somehow claim a little bit ownership. Well, the problem is like if you do like actual BPF probe, uh, core read, right, like the macro, mm -hmm. uh, kernel doesn't know that you're doing core enabled read. It's just like random value that it's reading from. The only case where kernel does know that you're reading something that's like BTF defined is like when we do direct memory reads from a fan tree. That's the only case where we can technically. Yeah, TB, hmm? TB BTF, yeah, we, TB we, BTF. We have uh, among those 24, I think maybe half of them are TB BTF. Okay.
other than tasks, do you support ownership, such as for, say, groups or a group of tasks? Uh, yeah, I think that's, uh, that's definitely a way to do that. And and actually, then, I see there's the talk later, or a discussion later on, like C group, or C group define the key problem or something. In, in some cases, I think uh, in the workload, we, we may have a lot of short-lived tasks that are residing within one C group because the tasks are very small and uh, have a very short lifetime. Um, that may kind of uh, increase your overhead of uh, uh, in your map size or if you store them task in the map. So I guess uh, you want to support not only single tasks, but also support a group of tasks, like a C group or task group in that case. Just one comment. Yeah, that's uh, something we, if we, we agree this is a way, that's definitely one way to, to improve it. So yeah, again, pretend I solve this. So, as in the socket, and the socket is a common use case, and I just threw a random idea, if a root maintain the program, that will populate the so socket to a map, and we use that map to do the filter for the actual user started BPF program. And, and that's like how to, if this is, whether we can do use root to enforce that, or as Alexi mentioned, we need to write the tool carefully, meaning we cannot do very, f that's gonna trade off the, the flexibility of the tools. That's gonna be some details that uh, we, we can discuss once we get sample code. Some. Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a different argument. My argument is like we can use some infrastructure to enforce that without writing the tool carefully. The other side of the argument is like, no, you cannot do that. You cannot get that much flexibility. You have to write the tools carefully. I'm trying to push on the more flexible and offload the security safety check to root on the uh, programs. The, but we still, the, the object ownership model and all that stuff, it still doesn't prevent you from writing. Like, of course, you'll have mitigation in place for like uh, uh, side channel attacks and stuff. But like, the, the, the new things come keep coming up. Like, there was the BHP stuff that came out a few months ago. So there is a, still a surface for users to craft a BPF program. That would be that has nothing to do with task structs or sockets, and in this case, just plain vanilla BPF code that could be used to like create side channels. So how do you? This doesn't solve that. Uh, I have no idea about that case. <laughs> I need to learn about it. Oh, that's Jason. Could we? Uh, oh, that's really loud. Uh, could we maybe? solve this with signing in a capability model and a policy or something? I mean, we're talking about signing later this afternoon, and so I was just wondering if that might be a solution to this problem. Uh, well, I mean, we, it's a solution to whatever this solution to. Great. That's what we're here for. <laughs> so move on. Yeah, more like button. So for the next is the switch. I just have this idea. So we have the switch, it has the previous and the next. So if we have two programs, one handle previous, other handle the next, we can use that as the owner check. If I program a handle next, I only trigger on next for my own task. Whether this is my own task or the task I have visibility from the, uh, the PID namespace. I'm not sure I understand PID namespace very well, but I think that's by splitting this into two programs and enforce the filtering for each of them, that sounds doable for me. So, yeah, more like a button, which is pretty good, useful rate, but of course that's a lot of work. So how do we do the filtering? I, 
had ideas, so we can use a trampoline for that. The root or even the kernel load a F entry program, and we have some mechanism to load that to every non root uh, BPF program. And if the filter says that we should skip this, we'll just skip that. Maybe I'll mention a use case that we had. I think it might be similar. Is, is we attach to lots of K probes, um, but we scope them at the very first couple lines by, well, by we would like to scope them every the first couple lines by the pod, which would be if in Kubernetes speak, which would be like the container C group. So is, was this basically a C group filter for K probes or F entry that would be run before you jump into the BPF program? Is that what you're proposing? This is actually what Stan, what you described, what Stan is doing. So it's a group based LSM hooks. It should be generalizable to like not only LSM, like LSM in this case, just an example. Um, but I want to say this, this here, I try to say how do you like uh, the, let the root to enforce that. So no matter what uh, the non-root user, uh, non-root user load a program, this is a, uh, enforce the check is not part of the generated uh, the this part not the, the it's not the code generated by BPF trace non root. Yeah, but it feels close though. It, it's no. it, it feels like to me that it, you're in the same space and could probably use that work for, for this if you generalized it to K probes and trace point and then what is also interesting is then I have another use case on top of that that has nothing to do with the, 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 non, the unprivileged debugging. It's actual use case where we have a lot of K probes and all of our programs right now would just have a switch at the very front of them that we could then delete, right? So that instead of calling, they, like imagine wanting to run like a full S trace type of thing, but only for your most paranoid users, right? Like you don't want to run that on everything in the system. So it's very... I think that the, the main the main thing here is that the filtering fit is is useful, right? Like this is why this is happening mm -hmm. for the LSM stuff. But the non-root part is the most questionable aspect of this, right? Like, can we mm -hmm. get, get, should we do it for non-root? Are there any security concerns? The filtering is is just awesome. We we need it. Like, there's no questions about that. Yeah, that's uh, always. Yeah, to to continue that thought. There's a point where, like if it's for observability tools, there's a point where I just need to go do host tracing anyway. So you give me a filtered view of disk IO events or whatever, and to fully understand it, I need to see the neighbors and how much I'm queuing on them. And so I'm just gonna go to the host, the container host, and then instrument it anyway. I, it would be nice to have some improvements to do some things within containers or non-root, but ultimately to get the big picture, I'm gonna have to go do root stuff anyway. Yeah, that is true. And actually, if we have a lot of users doing this itself, can slow down the system itself. <laughs> so, so it's, it's pretty, uh, I agree, there's a lot of problem we need to solve down the road. But uh, I, I, my point is wants to make is like, it is super useful. We want to at least give it a try to enable some use cases for people without the root permission. Yeah, I mean, I, I talk to developers all the time who are in containers, and they've got no way of beginning playing with BPF trace and things like that. Even giving them a limited subset of syscalls and these trace points and, and a few others will give them a way to get started and write their first one-liners and programs and then understand the value of getting full access. A different question, you might have it on a future slide, is apart from filtering the event, what about filtering the arguments? So if I'm able to see scheduled switch, am I able to see each of the arguments? Because some of them are for the other, the other task and not my task, and so they should be filtered. You may have the arguments as another slide. Yeah, this is actually filter based on arguments, right? You get the previous and the next. You get one program, you can only access previous, and you are filtered based on previous. You need another program to access uh, next, and that's only, you are filtered based on next. Okay, so you so if, if I'm looking at the trace point for sketch switch, you're filtering the arguments that I can access, 
So somewhere there's, it's, it's incur like you're allowed to access yeah, I think these Yeah, the verifier you take a look at, if your program uh, access previous, we will filter that on previous. If you access the next, you will filter on next. So, so where is this stored? Like where would the metadata be of here are the trace points and here are the arguments and members that uh, you're, you're allowed to access, and here's the arguments and members you're not allowed so, to access. So uh, the idea was like we have the verifier to generate a matrix, or well, uh, a, a set of flags. So you do this, you do that, and when you uh, try to attach the program, you use something to make a decision whether it's safe to do the attach. Yeah, I, I think there needs to be a, almost a database somewhere of, here's 200 trace points. <laughs> these ones you can trace. These arguments for these ones you can access. Everything else is blocked. And so that, like, that information yeah, that's, has to be provided uh, somewhere. Essentially true if you want full access, but uh, I think the case we can start with the SCAD switch to enable that because given how popular that one is, there are so many other like not so popular uh, trace point we don't need. Also, some of them, if we know this on contact switch, we just use current to do the filtering. We don't need, we only need this for whatever we use the argument as the filter. I mean, to, to Brendan's point about like creating this list of trace points, we already have stuff, uh, BTF ID lists in the kernel and we could do some sort of pointer tagging to say like this is accessible, but I, I just don't see the the exercise of the unprivileged stuff until we fix the security stuff, and we it's very hard to fix the security stuff there. Go I ahead. totally agree, <laughs> and for security stuff like eighty uh, percent of at least eighty percent of the time you say something I'll take it as my point. <laughs> we we could we could build some mitigations into the the PPF program itself that would like for for especially for some specter like attacks uh, some aggressive more more aggressive mitigations right like like so, kind of value um, flush after yeah actually the program. let's just trigger another idea already <laughs> so instead of doing the F entry uh, trampoline. We can have the verifier to insert the, the filtering into the program. Can we? I have this observation that like whatever pre-canned capabilities we give to users, someone will come and say that they need more flexibility. So like this kind of trend in the other direction, like let's predefine like what we can filter on. Like that will work in some cases, but then like there will always be users like, oh, we need like just this tiny tweak to, to this filtering. and like. Like all, all the stuff that we will do in kernel will just not work for them. So, uh, how do we resolve this tension between like flexibility and uh, um, like that? That was usually our answer, right? Like for like oh, like you have this complicated like kind of hard to formalize requirements. Use BPF code. Like you have control over like the filtering and all that stuff, right? Like here we are moving the other direction. We're saying like let's predefine that like you can filter on task or like on C group and stuff like that. It's it's kind of anti bpf -y, right? Yeah, then you move this back into the kernel, right? Or you, or you have something... The microphone is only partially working. Or you have something like the... what uh, Bjorn did for XDP, where you maybe generate a filter through BPF in the kernel, but... I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, well. I guess just general question to the audience is like, how much do we believe that we can actually statically enforce that some program is contained to like reading data about current task, for example. So like even if it's if, like, let's do mental exercise, right? Like you have this TPBTF that has task, task struct uh, type, right? And like, so uh, Verifier knows that you can, like BTF information, you can uh, follow pointers and all that stuff. At some point, task struct has a pointer to another task struct that you are not allowed to read. Like, can we prevent iterating through like my current task to another task and then doing whatever I want? Like, do we even believe it's possible to like enforce that like you are not going to go outside of like those 
task current task boundaries. Because I, I, I personally don't see how you can ever do that. Uh, and like, uh, by the way, I checked the uh, libpf tools. Like, it seems like half of them right now, at least, use bpf core read directly. Like, which for kernel is like read random memory. So like half of the tools. So like, if you disable bpf core read, can you even write a tool? Like some some partial cases, but I think in general, like this whole unbrief stuff, like with the latest Spectre BHB, the way the program is written there, it's not doing anything. It's like ten instructions, no jumps, nothing, and we have to like there is no practical way to detect that it's malicious. There's like it's just not doing anything, not reading any kernel memory whatsoever. Like, I'm saying I'm saying unprivileged like until like Intel fixes the CPUs like we cannot with software software we cannot work around hardware bugs If this were true we would have had land lock LSM being implemented with PPF right like this this was a wish list for a lot of things but it's it's it, practically it's never going to be true so the only case thing that you said in the first slide, which actually, where you said this is infeasible, is the one where, is the route we might have to take if we have to allow certain, uh, like, unprivileged processes to run BPF programs is pre-canned, signed, verified, based on a policy, those sort of programs. Uh, and it, 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 the policy might actually be signature-based there because, uh, as Alexei said, it's a very vanilla, simple instruction program that doesn't do anything fancy. So you can't have anything that says like, okay, I, I, I won't allow map accesses or pointer accesses. It's, it's just the way CPUs are built that you could, you could trick them into doing stuff uh, by just a few lines of assembly, right? So that, that's, that's the root of the issue there. So we can try for non-Intel, maybe. <laughs> This is, I mean, Alexei, Alexei said Intel, but you can generalize. This is, this is any modern processor that is doing some speculative execution is going to suffer with that. And most modern processors do that, so. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't make it too restrictive. I mean, do you want a situation where S-Trace is more powerful than, than unprivileged BPF for observability? Like, it can do more with S-Trace. That would kind of be sad. Like, we want some flexibility. My concern is signing programs and having things too canned, and like losing the flexibility of doing BPF trace one-liners. Oh no, this is this is uh, this is something we will discuss in the signing pro uh, thing, right? Like this is where your trust uh, for the tool itself. Oh, for the tool itself. Okay, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So we 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 will we will bring that up in the. Uh, we want to allow dynamic generation, but then you move the trust boundary. That's where you said the tool should be nicely written, and then where you verify that the yeah. tool can't be abused uh, to generate these gadgets there, right? Yes. So, so but I think if we go that direction, we need the tool to be really, really simple. So you cannot say, like, uh, I can make a BPF trace secure. It's like, it's just too large a body, so. I think the idea here is that, like, we trust BPF trace to verify that, like, some script is safe in one way or another, like signed, for example, right? Like you can sign the text of the script. And like if you trust BPF trace to verify the signature before the BPF trace actually is compiling the code, then you have like this chain of trust, basically. We trust BPF trace to trust the script. That, that's how it would work, probably. Right? Yep. Yeah, well, that's one way. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So, <laughs> so similar, like we, 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 we like libpf is a loader for BPF program, right? So you can teach libpf to verify signatures of like the ELF file, right? And like if you trust libpf to verify this, then like you can sign the ELF file without like uh, you know like with all the core stuff, like all that stuff before libpf actually like modifies the code, right? So it's again like trust trust chain. So similar idea. And, and tools won't be simple, right? Like. Tools will get complex because tools allow you to do complex things. Uh, and will they, will they, is this a foolproof solution? Uh, when you sign a binary, I actually trust the binary. It's, it, it comes to all of the thing, right? Software is inherently buggy and somebody will find an expert, somebody will fix it. But you, you sort of, your 
uh, it's the it's the best possible barrier to uh, like uh, highest possible barrier to entry for like getting I know this is reasonably safe so I sign it that is the risk that I'm willing to take I'm not willing to take the risk that I will allow any BPF program to run I'm willing to take the risk that I will I'm, al I'm allowing these BPF programs generated by BPF trace because I think it's reasonably safe so it's uh, nobody can say for sure right like this is uh, where it, where it depends on your threat model there yeah I see the point. A lot of the check, the filtering is easier to do in user space or in the BPF program before we get into the kernel. So, and, but I think the other side is like, if the kernel can provide some enhancement in secure, that's uh, what I hear. The, the answer I hear is like, that's impossible or doesn't worth the effort. So uh, I think for like true and privileged, like signatures and everything, uh, ideally, like we, like as a VPF community, would work with hardware vendors, with CPU vendors, with Intel and ARM and others, and actually ask them what we need to actually make it safe. Uh, like it could be like if you sort of like end branch instruction that Intel implemented, we could do something like this for the BPF and say, well, never execute BPF program in a speculative way. That was just like eliminate all known attacks so far we had. It just needs a little bit extra work on the CPU side. So, I think they, they, you lose performance, yes. But they do have it on ARM64 maybe to some degree, I think. To disable speculation, I'm not sure how expensive this is actually, but well, I'm not saying okay. disable ex speculation completely. Like end branch, <laughs> like end branch instruction is like saying like you can only jump there like when you knew that it is a target of indirect branch. ISA, ISA guarantees that there will be no side effects for that, like for this particular branch. I, I think like the performance argument is is is. Of course, we want BPF programs to be, but it's a, it's a step towards. Allowing, so Brendan was saying it allows users to craft PPF programs and try them out if they are safe. They'll be slow. Like, they'll be not the fastest ones. Sometimes that is enough for me to debug something anyways, right? Like, I, I don't need my program to be really fast in a, in a simple setting. So maybe, currently, we could just uh, do a barrier like MSR, right, to, uh, for, like, uh, uh, to flush out the, like, I, IPBB uh, barrier. Uh, at at the end of at, at every uh, at like every BPF program exit or every branch, we just it will be horribly slow. But sure. But the problem is you don't know whether that's actually enough or not. I mean, we would have yes, to. Yes, this, yeah. this is a whole kind of firm. Yes. Exactly, yes. I just forgot one point, and that is it's not just people playing around with this stuff and learning it. It's going to be all of the third party companies who are coming up with observability agents and security agents and trying to get adoption. And then they, they find that people are in container environments and they can't run them at all. So yeah, I think this is pretty important now that I think about it. So imagine all of those companies who are building stuff, agents that they want users to run. So, so the question is how do we enable this then? Alexei had an idea we should talk, we should work with the hardware hardware vendors and figure out the right strategy about it. And it, it can't just be Intel, right? Like it, it has to be other, other like the end branch stuff. Is there any equivalent on uh, on AMD or on ARM, whatever? So, but we maybe this is something BSC could help with? Yeah, I mean, I have bad ideas, like don't run containers, just everyone run on bare metal and problem solved. <laughs> Okay, if I get uh, a lot of neck, let's move on. So I think this is, as I call, I think people talk about this idea, not just me, it's like we want a, a BPF LSM hook on this BPF. So we have some program to decide whether some program can be loaded by some, or some operation is okay uh, for non-privileged users. And the other idea was that we had verifier, because when we load the program, we really have no idea what it looks like. We are gonna do the 
verifier to tell us what the program look like and we do the actual filtering on the attach times, something we cannot attach. For example, someone doing probe read and maybe that means everything is really useful. But uh, that's the idea. This, this very much sounds like what Hal was talking yeah. earlier, right? Yes. And what John wanted to. <laughs> yeah, it's the same idea. Exactly the same idea. So, a little bit more like what this looks like. Uh, this something is the default, the gig mode. So, if you a non privileged user load a program, you need a whatever uh, gatekeeper F entry program to really run the program. If there's no gatekeeper F entry program attached, then you just always skip it. That is, is the case if you have like for whatever reason the the root forgot to load the F entry the program to enforce the security, we will just uh, always skip the program. And the next is the BPF, BPF, LSM BPF hooks, and uh, also the verifier generate attributes. It's probably just gather existing uh, it's information we already got in the verifier. And that's it. Thank you.